Hey everybody, Norm from Tested here at Comic-Con 2019. Checking in with Stephen Lane of Prop Store. Stephen, how are you doing this year? I'm great, man. Great to see you here again. Yeah, absolutely. You guys have brought a ton of stuff, as always. A great chance to get up close with some of the costumes and props and special effects from films that we love. Got to start off with some gremlins. So, oh, yeah. you got a gizmo here. Uh, how is this used in the film? Uh, this is actually a lighting stand-in version. So on the back of the Gremlin itself, there's actually one of the, uh, a, a blue screen rod that comes out the back of it for a puppeteer to hold. So this is for setting up the shots, getting the lighting balances right, um, getting the positioning correct, because it was so time consuming for the guys to actually have the animatronic puppets on set or have the puppeteered puppets on set as well. So this guy would be there while they're getting everything ready and then they move him out of the way, bring the hero version in as well. But still a great piece of work by Rick Baker. It's a great example of how film productions make multiple multiple versions of things, not just stunt versions and hero versions, but different functional, purposeful versions for filmmaking, much like the shoes here. Iconic shoes from Back to the Future 2. Now this I've never seen before because this has a purpose. So. Yeah, so what's great about these particular boots is that these are this is the special effects hero close-up version. So that, that famous shot where the boot tightens on its own, the self-lacing, it's just some guy sitting underneath the stage pulling those excess pieces of strap, boom, pull it tight. And that is this boot for that shot. And you can see that because underneath the laces come out and there you have the extra laces, you have the slack yeah. there. I can't believe that. So yeah, and then cool. you can also see the cable that's coming out the back there. So that's for all the lighting effects on the boot at the same time. So this would all power up and light up too. So a real piece of movie history there. Right. And from uh, practical or special effects that you wear to miniatures, you also have stuff from Fifth Element. That is an amazing miniature. Tell me about the taxi. Yeah, so you, here we have the studio scale Corbin Dallas uh, taxi miniature. Uh, this is uh, specifically used for the sequence after Lilu does that swan dive off the building, goes through the top of the cab, and that's what you can see there. You can see the hole where she's pierced it as she's gone through, and actually if you look closely inside, there is a miniature Lilu in there, crouched down, used for that shot. This has multiple motion control mounting points built into it, so you can be shot from all different angles. It lights up as well like a Christmas tree, so it has all the lights on it. And then on one side of it, if you uh, look very closely, you can see all the bullet hits that are teched in on the side of it as well from that sequence where the police cars are shooting at it. So great, great miniature used for a number of shots in the film. And that's something that's easy for you to verify because they only made so many of these and, and miniatures. But for something like shoes, you have Forrest Gump shoes here, you actually need a screen match when he's wearing that for all the different shots in the film. Yeah, I, th I think the shoes are such an integral part of the story for Forrest Gump. Legs, shoes, running, um, it's all part of that theme. And what's phenomenal about these shoes is that we have a continuity Polaroid of Tom Hanks sitting on the bus stop bench where he's telling that whole story and these screen match to that continuity Polaroid. So we know without question they would have had m multiple sets, as you said previously. They, they would have had sets where they were brand new when he's just starting to run and more weathered and muddy, but this is the shot. But on, the, on that bench, these are those shoes that are used for that. And it comes with his socks as well, just in case you want the socks. <laughs> in case you want the socks. That's something probably wardrobe department got off the shelf. They bought a bunch of these Nikes. But then prop departments also have to make the props from all sorts of things. And you have the holy hand grenade. You had an interesting story about the making of this. Yeah, I mean, in, in true sort of British budget filmmaking style, which was sort of indicative of a lot of the Monty Python films that were being made during that era, they didn't have a lot of money to build things. So this is actually the bullcock out of a toilet cistern that has been converted and modified. It was painted gold. Uh, obviously, the, the jeweled section, the pin, if you like, to the hand grenade uh, is a fully custom built. But this started life uh, as a toilet bullcock. I mean, how cool is that? <laughs> <laughs> and very appropriate, of course, to Monty Python. Of course. Yeah, behind it, uh, from Excalibur, I know Adam's going to love this. Is this a Terry English piece? Yeah, yes, it is a Terry. It's actually been consigned directly by Terry English to the auction. Uh, so this is Helen Mirren's breastplate. This is the version that she wears uh, when she's seducing Merlin. So it's, uh, I think at the time it was deemed quite a risque piece of uh, costuming. And uh, there are some great publicity stills of Helen Mirren wearing this. And it's, it's been signed on the inside of it by Terry English as well. Oh, that's wonderful, wonderful. You got so many stuff, things here. You got ghost traps. You even have hand props, not just from Star Wars, from Star Trek this year. Tell me about some of these phasers is have. Yeah, yeah, we've got multiple phases from uh, from the different shows. Um, this is coming to us from a couple of different collections, and I think it's a great example of some of the, the tech that was being built during that era that's been sort of reflected as the years have gone by, and we've seen those changes to them as well. We've got hero functional tricorders, uh, push button phases, we've got the static version as well. And actually, in this year's auction, uh, what's special about this year's auction is the fact that it's a, it's a two day 
event with over 900 lots. So we moved up from 600 lots on one day, 900 lots over two days. So I think we've got about 30 to 40 different Trek items in the auction. And that ranges from these phasers and hand props right the way through to Leonard Nimoy's Spock complete costume as well from the original series, which is an amazing thing. I mean, every prop is a little bit of a history lesson about fabrication, about special effects of the time, the, the plastics that were used, the foam latex that was used, the paint techniques, the electronics, and you have things that were made 30 years ago, 40 years ago, to things that were made very recently for Rogue One, you guys have an astromech. This is like maybe one of the big flagship things that's manufactured using modern techniques. Full aluminum. Yeah, absolutely. It's, uh, we like to call it aluminium, but we'll go with aluminium. Um, yeah, it's, it's a full aluminium construction droid. I mean, this thing weighs hundreds of pounds. It's fully practical, fully functional, fully remote control. It has the third leg that's tucked up inside it. You press a button, it drops down, it rocks into the driving position, the dome rotates, all the lights change. It's an amazing piece of kit. So this is one of the droids that was built by the R2-D2 Builders Club. And I, I don't really remember when the films were coming out in production, Kathleen Kennedy talks about how they were involving the R2 Builders Club and those guys of course it's their own personal droids so they they went home with them afterwards and now they're like well it's too valuable just as a as a fan item this is something that features in Rogue One this particular droid is seen in the Alliance hangar uh, on Yavin 4 in, Yoke, in Row 1. It's also uh, featured in the visual guide, it's illustrated in the visual guide, so it's really well documented, and it's just a phenomenal thing to play with. You know, you get the remote control out and just wheel that thing around, and it's, it's, a, it's a real full-size remote control droid from Star Wars. And because it's, it's you know, built by fans, they want to get all the functionality in one unit. They are not, they're not going to make four or five of those, one for a different shot, they want everything in one, and it still works. Yeah, oh yeah, it's still fully practical. And it even has that function. Remember when R2-D2 gets fried and all the panels pop open? That's exactly what this droid can do as well. It's an amazing piece of kit, an amazing build. Wow, that's very cool. This is an auction happening uh, this fall, in September? Yes, that's correct. It's actually, as I say, a two-day sale that's taking place on the 30th of September and also the 1st of October at the London venue that we always use, the Odeon BFI IMAX. It'll be streamed online, so you can go to propstore.com forward slash live auction, and the catalogue will be released right towards the end of August, uh, first week of September, so keep an eye out for it then. We can't wait to see that catalogue. One of the, my favorite things to come out every year from you guys, and thank you for bringing all these props. We're going to get a closer look at some of these pieces, but it's great to see you, Stephen. It's been a pleasure, man. Thanks for coming by.